Good. So this is one of my favorite quotes, and I learned this quote when I was about eight years old. And it begins, in a good cause, there are no failures. Does anybody know how it ends? Whoops. <laughs> that was a failure. In a good cause, there are no failures, only delayed successes. And this is like, I, I learned this when I was maybe eight or nine years old. Anybody know who said this? You're my new best friend if you do. <laughs> It's from Isaac Asimov, who was a science fiction writer, and this was a quote from one of the characters in one of his stories. And, you know, this became in many ways the theme of my life, which was really good because I've had a lot of failures in life. And, but it learned, it, I learned from this to really see failures as setbacks and as delayed successes. And tonight what I want to do is talk about three that I've encountered uh, working in tech and working particularly with women in tech and some of the failures around the industry to be able to serve women in tech. But before I do that, um, I work in AI. So some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight is AI related. So I'm going to do a quick like two minute crash course into machine learning for people who aren't familiar with machine learning. So how many programmers in the room? Okay. How many non-programmers in the room? Oh, <laughs> nice. So I picked the right slides. Okay. So imagine if you are a programmer and you have to write an application for activity detection. I, I, I'm supposed to animate this slide, but it's not animated. Delayed success, not a failure. Uh, so imagine like if, uh, for example, how many people are wearing like an Apple Watch or a Google Watch or something like that, right? And how many of you use that for activity detection? Like if you're walking or running, right? Most of you, that's why you buy them. Now think about what it would be like to program one of those. It might be able to, for example, take a look at the speed that the person is moving at and in this case, you say, hey, if their speed is less than four, they're prob four miles an hour, they're probably walking. And then you can say, okay, let's detect if they're running. If their speed is less than four, they're probably walking. Otherwise, they're probably running. Then you need to add biking to that. And you go, well, if their speed's less than four miles an hour, they're probably walking. If it's less than 12 miles an hour, they're probably running. Otherwise, they're biking. And then your boss who loves golf asks you to build golf into this thing. And you go, oh, crap. <laughs> How can I write code for that? How can I, like for some people, I'm sure Chiro, when he hits a golf ball, it goes about 200 yards. And me, when I hit a golf ball, I walk like this far and then hit another one and walk <laughs> this far. And, like, and that's not even playing mini golf. That's with a real golf clubs. And it's, so it's like everybody's different. And as a result, trying to write code for this is very, very difficult to do and almost impossible. So the idea behind machine learning is um, to, take, to be able to solve problems like that by taking what we do in traditional programming and flipping it around a little bit. So traditional programming, the top part of this slide, is that those of us who are coders, we could like abstract everything we do into that top box. And that is, we create rules. We write rules in a programming language, whatever that language is, Python, Java, C Sharp, whatever. Those rules act on data, and they give us answers. So for example, if speed is less than four, they're probably walking. The rules are if speed is less than four, the data is four. You know, and then the answer coming in that is they're probably walking. The whole revolution about machine learning and all of the hype around machine learning is just flipping the axes on this diagram to get what's at the bottom. And sorry for the folks at the back if it's hard to see. But the idea is that instead of us expressing rules in a programming language, we know the answers and we have data and we get a machine to infer what those rules are and tell us what those rules are. So now, instead of solving a problem like activity detection, like we did earlier on by trying to figure out the rules, we put a device on people and we measure the data that they have when they label it as walking. Like those of you who have an Apple Watch and you go for a run, what's the first thing you do? You go, I'm running, right? So what you're doing is you're labeling that data and sending that data back to Apple. Or if you're using one of our watches, you're doing the same thing. By the way, I'm from Google. Uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself from that. You know, so as a result, gather lots and lots of data that's labeled as walking, gather lots and lots of data labeled as running, lots of data labeled as biking, and lots labeled as golfing or sort of golfing in my case. So now what happens is, instead of us trying to figure out the rules about what makes walking or running or biking, what a, computer, what a computer can do is start matching patterns in that data that a human may not see. And that effectively is what machine learning is all about. And that's a way that we can open up new ways to build applications that weren't previously possible. It's no coincidence that great devices like the Apple Watch are now available with the machine, re with the machine learning revolution going on around us. And it's only just beginning. So that's a quick brief into machine learning and AI and how it all works. Because I wanted to give that brief because that's important for the next three stories that I want to tell that are about failure. But before I tell those stories, I want to do a little social experiment with you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Just want to. That's my summary. Answers and data in, rules out. I want to do a little social experiment with you. Okay. So I was talking about you now can create systems by giving them data. So I want you to give me some data. 
and I'm going to say a word. And I want you to think, most times I'll say this word and an image is going to flash in your mind and describe what that image is, okay? Are you ready? The word is wedding. Okay, I hear whites, I hear flowers. What's that? Rain? <laughs> oh, ring. <laughs> I never heard rain before. Okay, ring, good. Cake, a dress. Cake, okay. All right, so you probably all have that kind of image in your mind, like bride in a white dress, maybe a groom in a tuxedo, flowers, cake, not rain, but ring. <laughs> it actually rained at my wedding, so that's why. <laughs> so um, anybody have any different images to that, out of curiosity? Okay. Okay. Right, so you had an image of a same-sex wedding because you saw the thing about Ellen DeGeneres, and that's a very rare response. Most of the time, I'll say wedding, the first response is man, woman, man in tuxedo, bride in dress, right? So think about if we, in this room, were to try to teach an AI what a wedding is, okay? If you hadn't said that, everybody would have taught the AI that a wedding is a man and a woman, and it's a man in a tuxedo and a woman in a white dress and that kind of thing. And this is a problem when feeding data into AIs to train them, and the problem is called bias. That if not enough people with not enough viewpoints are feeding data into the computers, and if you remember my previous diagram, it's about answers and data, and then the computer will infer the rules. So if an alien landed and came on stage to talk to us today, and we we're trying to say this is what a wedding is, and we said ring and flowers and cake and that kind of stuff, it wouldn't understand the entirety of a wedding, right? So this is where the first set of mistakes can happen. And let me show you a picture that's a little bit of a shocking picture, but these are results of a fully trained AI. Are you ready? Okay. So take a look at these four pictures and take a look at how a, a, an AI interpreted them. And this is a common open source image recognition algorithm. The one on the left is a Jewish wedding, and the man's wearing white instead of a black tuxedo. Uh, the woman's in a white dress, but it actually still recognizes it as a wedding. The one in the middle here, this beautiful lady in the dress, you know, obviously it's the classic bride in a white dress and it recognizes bride ceremony and it still recognizes a wedding. The cliched one that most of us came up with, man in a tuxedo, woman in a white dress, flowers, that kind of thing, it recognizes a wedding. But look at the picture on the right. This is a wedding. But all of the people who trained this AI never considered multicultural weddings like this. And I'm not sure what country it's from, it's from an African country. But then what did it come up with? Person and people was all the AI could actually recognize this as. What you think about, it's kind of highly offensive and it really it marginalized people. Uh, my wife is from Hong Kong. And so we got married here in London. And then we also went to Hong Kong and got married. And uh, if you know a wedding banquet in Hong Kong, the bride wears a red dress. And when a person first did this experiment on me, I never even considered a bride in a red dress, even though my own wife wore a, wed a red dress. <laughs> you know? I think she's watching the live stream, so I'm probably in trouble now. Uh, <laughs> so here's like the first mistake. So traditional computing tends to be relatively few people writing code. And then that code gets compiled, and then that code is used to build systems. With machine learning and AI, it's relatively few people gathering data and training an AI with that data. What happens when you have relatively few people gathering that data? Mistakes like this one. Okay, to me, this is not a failure, this is a delayed success. The optimist in me realizes that seeing something like this, it makes it much easier to debug because you can see the problem, right? If this was a problem in thousands of lines of code and it was something buried deep in code that introduced a bias, it's much harder to spot that. But in this case, like I said, the optimist in me says, this failure can be a delayed success. We can change our models, we can relabel and we can retrain. It's a relatively trivial example with a wedding, We've probably all seen on the news other examples of where AIs classified something much more offensively than this, but this is how it happens. So that's the first story, and it's the first story of failure. And to me, like I said, bias in AI is a massive problem, but it's an easily fixable problem. And one of the ways that we fix that problem is by having multiple viewpoints on the data. 
multiple age, multiple races, multiple national origin, multiple sexual orientation. Thank you for bringing up the same-sex wedding. You're the only person who's ever done it. And I've done this speech about 10 times, you know, which is, which is really incredible. And so, you know, as a society, we're changing. And hopefully, as a society, as we have more people involved and we're open and encouraging for more people to get involved, then situations like this wouldn't happen. So that's failure number one and the learning from that and the delayed success that comes from it. Okay, failure number two. If you remember back to this slide, I deliberately showed a woman in the emoji in this slide. And there's a story behind this. And this story comes from a friend of mine that I'm lucky enough and I'm fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in Japan. Um, I do some teaching in universities in Japan. And uh, a couple of years ago, I got into running because this friend of mine was a very ardent runner. And she was like telling me off that I got to visit Japan a lot and all I did was see the office and see restaurants. And it's like, there was all these beautiful places to go running. So she would like text me and say, go running in these places and this kind of thing. And I hope this doesn't sound sexist, but being a woman, I always find that they, she communicates much more in emojis. <laughs> you know? And she sent me a message like this one. And it was like, hey, Lawrence, do you want to go running at the Imperial Palace, the Emperor's Palace? We, foreigners call it the Imperial Palace, locals call it the Emperor's Palace. I don't know why. So she sent a text, something like this, do you want to run at the Emperor's Palace tomorrow morning? And, oh, sorry, one little background to this story is that she works for a competitor of Google, and we have a little joke that's going on between us, was that she will send me an IM using their IM platform, I will send back IMs using our IM platform to see if who can convert the other to the other person's IM platform first. Uh, but she'd sent this thing to me, and this is maybe four years ago, and I wanted to send something back with an emoji of a woman running and a man running. And, oh, by the way, this is more like what it's like when we're running than she's... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it, I think it's a part of the story that I'll get to a little bit later, but I don't think it's a coincidence that the fact that the man is kind of upright and not running very hard, whereas the woman is really going for it. And uh, these are uh, the emojis in Android 10, by the way. So I was trying from my keyboard to send a message back to her with emojis for running. Now, nowadays, most of the time we'll do our messaging on a phone, and when you want to send an emoji, there's a menu and you pick it from a menu. But back then, if you're doing it from a laptop or something like that, if you wanted an emoji, you didn't really do a menu. You had short codes for doing the emoji. And the short code for running looked like this. So I would like send something back, and it's like, okay, let's go running. And I'll type bracket, running, close bracket. What did I get? A man running. Do you know how to get a woman running with a short code emoji? Anybody in the audience know how to do it? That's telling enough, right? Okay. This is how, it took me hours to figure it out, and this is how I ended up figuring it out. Are you ready? I had to type this. <laughs> so it was the running plus the Venus symbol. So now the next question is, does anybody know how to type the Venus symbol on a keyboard? <laughs> All right. Anybody? Yeah. When I was creating these slides a couple of weeks ago, I had to install a whole new keyboard driver on my Mac just to be able to get that, to put it in the slide. You know, thankfully, we're not in that state anymore. But this is what I had to type on this instant messaging platform to get a woman running. And how you get the Venus symbol is there's a Unicode for the Venus symbol. And in Windows, if you hold down the Alt key and type the four-digit Unicode, Windows will give you the Venus symbol. I can't remember what the four-digit Unicode for that is. Um, it's, unfortunately, it's even more difficult nowadays. Like I said, I had to install a, an extra soft keyboard on my Mac just to be able to get it. So, can anybody see what's wrong with this? <laughs> right? It's wrong on a whole number of layers. Okay? First of all, the default state for running is a man. Okay? That, that's the, the easy and obvious and still terrible one. The second one is that if you want to get a woman running and to have equality, even in something like an emoji, you have to go through all this extra work in order to do that. And then the third one is that this extra work is like really, really difficult. You know, when I shared this with my friend, she actually joked and she laughed about it. And she's saying, yeah, well, the woman is an enhanced version of the man. So it's okay to have the enhancement. But she was just trying to help me save face. And it, it was a really difficult problem. Now, why do you think this would arise? Those of us who are coders, why do you think something like this would happen? That we default to a man. Okay. <laughs> White male coders, most likely, okay? And, but, so, when you, I started digging into the source code of this, and one of the great things about working at a big tech company is you can look at a lot of source code. And I started digging into the source code of this, and I saw source code that looked a little bit like this, 
where it's a case of, you know, if the input text of the person type and you can turn it, convert it to lower string, and if it contains running, then you add the running emoji. And that's what the source code had originally looked like. And the reason why it looked like that was that if you go way back, you know, to the original emojis, it was like a little stick figure. And a little stick figure running was genderless. It was just a stick figure running. So you could write code that says, OK, you know, if somebody types a short code, let's make it running. But then displays got more advanced, graphics got more advanced, and then that stick figure became a cartoon figure that really looks like a man. And then someday somebody said, wait a minute, we can't just have a male emoji. We have to have female emojis too. So how would we incorporate the female emoji? Well, you would think you would write code like this. Right, where it says, OK, let's make a, something that says, like, man running. And if it's a man running, we'll put the emoji male. And if it's woman running, we'll put the emoji female. What's wrong with this code, those of us who are coders? Getting rid of the top code and bringing in the bottom code. Yeah, it's not backwards compatible, right? You end up with a regression problem. And as a result now, if we, in, if like as an industry, we brought out something like this, then everybody who had been used to using running, their experience would break. So you couldn't just have a man running and a woman running. You would have to still have running. So they ended up compromising and writing code like this one, where it says, OK, we'll still have running. Let's have some enhanced condition for running. And it's like, if it contains the, the Venus symbol, we'll have running emoji female. Otherwise, we'll have running emoji male. And the reason why this code then ended up succeeding was, it didn't break the regression, you still had running, and whoever was testing this never really considered that it's slightly offensive to make it much more difficult to type a female running emoji, and we ended up with code like this. The fortunate thing is, as an industry, that we've had a delayed success with this, not because we fixed the code, this broken code is still everywhere, uh, but not because we fixed the code, but because we've changed the user interface that we're using. Primarily now we use, uh, how many of you have ever typed a short code on your phone? You'll hold down the emoji, you'll pick the emoji, and you'll send it, and you're not thinking about a short code. But this broken code is still in lots and lots of places. And uh, see if you can find some. Uh, they're not in Google's code anymore, but they are in some other code. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, this is the second failure. That, you know, starting from a simple condition where it was just a stick figure for running, Nobody ever considered gender when it was just a stick figure, but then as things evolved and we had more advanced graphics and we had male, or we had an emoji that looks obviously like a male and then added emojis that looked obviously like a female, nobody thought of this and nobody thought of the difficulties that would come out of that. So while this failure came, became a delayed success, it's kind of a lucky win just because the user interface has changed. Okay, so those are two of the stories. And now the third one I have to share is the most difficult because this is a current and ongoing failure. And it's one of the things that I'm working on personally to try and fix. And, but it's going to be a long road. And that's why I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. And there's so many women in tech here tonight and so many men in tech who have come to a women in tech event. You know, that apply your brains to this problem because I think this is a problem that we all need to work on to be able to solve. I go back to the beginning when I spoke about the wedding and I spoke about AI and I spoke about the bias that was in that. And we, because Originally, we didn't have that diversity of viewpoint with the training data. So this number, 28%. 28%, according to US statistics, are the number of females in undergraduate degrees in computer science. It's a pretty good number. It's not great, but it's not bad. Okay, and it's growing, which is, which is also good. This number, between 25 and 28%, is from, the, I think it's the National Software Foundation in the US, are the number of women in STEM careers somehow associated with computer science. Now initially you might think, this is great. If there are 28% in undergraduate degrees and 25 to 28% actually working, then it's a case of as we increase the pipeline by having more woman, women in undergraduate degrees, we'll also have more women in the workplace. And a lot of people go, problem solved. It's a beautiful thing. Anybody see the problem in that? Okay, the clear and the clear-cut problem is very, very subtle, and it's something that I want to go into in the next few slides, and this is the most difficult part. And that is, how do you measure these people? How do you measure that there are 25 to 28%? Considering also that there are market forces driving companies to report that more women are working in STEM, right? So I'm trying to dig into these figures to see exactly how many women are working, particularly in software engineering, and are engaged in it. I want to share some of my results with you tonight. And these results are a little bit disheartening and they're a little bit saddening. And I do want to kind of share this not as a criticism of women, 
but this is our industry and what our industry is doing to fail women and how can we succeed and how can we make our software industry better for women. And my, our viewpoint and the philosophy that my division and Google are working on is if we make it better for women, we'll make it better for everybody. And the same logic will apply if we make it better for different races, different ages, different viewpoints, different, as well as different genders. But the focus that I've been doing is on gender. So my next number I'm going to share is 10%. So what I did was I work in an open source product called TensorFlow. And TensorFlow, as I've mentioned, is open source. And being open source, it's on GitHub. And a lot of the feedback that I get that is very difficult for women in tech, particularly in software engineering, is that the work environment can be very hostile towards women. Have, out of interest, how many of you have felt that? Yeah, a lot of hands. And I usually get a lot of hands when I do that. So what I wanted to do was, can I find a statistic that is largely anonymous, that has nothing to do with the workplace, that would give me a strong signal for women's involvement in tech? And with an open source project on GitHub, you can do something called starring it. By starring it, that just means that you basically you like it. It's like hitting like in Facebook. And so it's an anonymous thing. So we have about 150,000 stars on TensorFlow. And uh, I did a little bit of scripting hocus pocus where there's an API in GitHub called Stargazers, where you can pull the IDs of everybody who has starred something. And then one by one, I went through these IDs to get their name and their location. And then for these 150,000 had a name and location, Google has a geolocation API that I could use to filter out weird locations, because somebody could say they're Bob from Mars, and, uh, and stuff like that, to find real names and real locations. And then there are third-party services that offer gender inference if you give a first name and a location. So for example, if it's Tracy from London, it's like 99% that it's female. But if it's Tracy from Toronto, Canada, it's like 70% chance that it's female. So it's a really cool service. So I went through all of the names and locations, and um, I picked all of those that had greater than 67% probability of that gender. And it ended up filtering my 150,000 down to about 60,000. And of those 60,000, 10% were female. So this is the first problem that we're looking at and looking at trying to address. Why, if 25 to 28% of software engineers are female, are only 10% of them starring it on GitHub? We don't know. And it's one of the things we really want to look into. And it's one of the things I'm imploring and really asking everybody here, if you have feedback and if you've got data that you could share that will help us to fix this, I'd really love it. The second number I'm going to share is 5%. Uh, so one of the things that I do is I teach uh, online courses. So I have an online course on Coursera and machine learning and TensorFlow. And uh, between all the different courses um, that I teach directly, I have about 140 to 150,000 students. And then there's um, code that I wrote and syllabus that I wrote for other MOOCs that have about the same number between them. So I'm combining about 300,000 students from all of these MOOCs. And the data that I gathered about female students on these courses is that it's 5%. Um, part of this is largely because these courses are international and there are some countries where the women participation in software is much lower than it is in the UK and the US, but still the 5% number is really disappointing. Again, I'm not criticizing women, it's more a case of what is wrong with our industry that's leading this low level of participation. A lot of the times what we found is that unfortunately women tend to hit a glass ceiling very early in their career. And if they want to spend some time and some money and some corporate money to go and do a training, they're hearing, no, you can't do that. And you know, so this is one of the reasons I'm seeing why it's this low, but we're still trying to research why it's this low. So then the next number, um, and this to me is the saddest one of all, is um, I run the YouTube channel for Google AI. And as part of running the YouTube channel, I get access to all of the statistics and all of the data of people watching our videos. And in many cases for our videos, it's less than 1% of the uh, viewership is female. So this to me, again, in particular for YouTube, is telling me that we're doing a really, really bad job with YouTube and with our content on YouTube of reaching female developers. Because this number, it's almost a statistical error. Um, it's that low. So the questions then come, and common wisdom comes like, how do you fix this? And the first thing, like when we talk a lot, for example, with women's groups, is that uh, more representation, more diversity on the channel. So one of the things that we've been doing on our channel is we try to keep it at a minimum one-third of the presenters are women, at a minimum. And so, for example, this is um, 
Carmel Allison, uh, she's an engineering manager on our team, an absolutely brilliant and engaging speaker. And this is the second most popular video on our channel with a woman presenting. And one of the things that it's, it's, it goes against common knowledge that you would think that a female presenter would actually attract more female views. But the truth has been, it's the other way around. Uh, this video with Carmel is our second most popular video on YouTube, and it's got less than 1% female viewership. And this video, also by Carmel, has got less than one-tenth of the female viewership of that previous one. So it's really just a blip. So again, in a good cause, there are no failures, only delayed successes. We're trying to figure out how do we turn this into a delayed success, and we really need your help. We really love your feedback as good, strong women in tech, as good, strong men who are willing to come to an, a women in tech event to try and figure out why is this happening. One of the things that we've been doing and a couple of the signals that we found that have worked is a lot of it is the subject matter. So this video, Machine Learning Fairness, is our highest watched video by percentage amongst women and has about 10% viewership by women um, on our YouTube channel. It's an absolutely brilliant video. If you get a chance, go check it out. That slide that I showed earlier on of the wedding came from this talk at Google I.O. And these are two really strong women who really, really have deeply researched machine learning fairness. And they talk about that as well as some of the tools from Google to enable machine learning fairness. So another piece of common wisdom, the first one was diversity of presenters. And so we've tried to fix that. Um, the good news is the overall channel's female viewership, since we started adding female, um, more female presenters, has tripled. It's still a very low number, but it has tripled. So that was the first step in fixing it, but it's not enough. We really need to go further. So right now I'm aiming at, earlier I said, 10% of women have starred TensorFlow and GitHub. If we can get our channel to 10% viewership, that's our first milestone. And anything you can do, any feedback that you can give me to help with that, I'd really appreciate. Then the second piece of common wisdom, and it's a lot of anecdotal evidence that I heard, um, and almost every time I speak with women in tech about this, I'll get this feedback was along the lines of, outside of the office, women tend to be more likely to not do work-related things. The burden of cooking and looking after children tends to fall on women, even though you have a full day job. And almost everybody I've spoken to has said that feedback to me, and it's the truth. But then when I start looking at the numbers, I want to show these two charts. So these two charts are volume of traffic by day. And so the bottom one in particular, if you take a look at it, um, there are five peaks, followed by two smaller peaks. So you can guess which days are Monday through Friday, and you can guess which days are Saturday and Sunday, and you can guess when is office time and when is non-office time. So what I did was I started analyzing this data by cutting these peaks and saying, if that were true universally, and we have 25% female developers, and they only did time in the office, then you know, accessing uh, machine learning content, accessing developer content, then if 25% of these peaks were female and the rest were male, so almost everything out of the office and on weekend were male, it would lead to about 15% of uh, volume of viewership would be female. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So the anecdotal evidence and all of my experience with the anecdotal evidence is, points it to be true. But when I start looking at the mass evidence, when I start looking at millions of people instead of the few dozen that I can speak to, we're beginning to see that that's not the case. So there's a problem here. And to me, a problem is also an opportunity. There is an opportunity for us to turn this failure into a delayed success. I think there's a lot of things that we can all do. Meetups like this one are a massive, massive start to that. As uh, Yoda was mentioning earlier on, like being able to network with each other, being able to learn from each other, being able to encourage each other is a huge thing. For the men in the audience and for the men watching, it's to be brothers to the women around you. Um, I, I honestly don't like the word ally, because allies seem to be different people in a war against a common enemy. I think we should be brothers and sisters. Um, so forgive me if a, a lot of you I know use the word ally, but I prefer not to use it. You know, I think we should be you know, shoulder to shoulder with each other to make a better working environment and turn this current failure into a delayed success. So with that in mind, I know it's a little bit of a downer at the end, but it was, I think it was something that was very important that I wanted to share with you. And I want to go back to that original quote. In a good cause, there are no failures, only delayed successes. One of the corollaries of that was that once you have a success, you know it's a good cause, right? 
And so it's, uh, I'm fully confident and fully optimistic that we as an industry can turn this into a success. We're working really, really hard on doing it. We're not there yet. And we just hope that you can give us feedback. This is my email address, elmaroni at google.com or on Twitter, I'm at elmaroni. Feel free to give me any feedback, any suggestions. If you don't like what I said, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> I know somebody said in one of the earlier talks to be bold and sometimes don't be a people pleaser. And I think this topic is so important that we can't be people pleasers, that sometimes we do have to crack some eggs if we want to make an omelet. And as an industry, sometimes I think we've kind of leaned towards going, you know, let's pad these statistics, let's put people who are non-technical into the bucket and say, yay, look at us, we got diversity, we got 25% female viewership. But when we start looking at then the deep stats of those who are software developers engaging with software developer content, we're not there yet. We want to get there, we're working hard to get there. So please help us. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much.